All right. Um, I guess we can get started. I'll introduce our speaker, uh, Jeremy Manning, for all, so we can welcome Jeremy. Jeremy Manning is an assistant professor of psychology and brain sciences at Dartmouth and the director of the Contextual Dynamics Lab. He and his group study human learning, memory, cognition, and brain structure using machine learning, behavioral experiments, and brain recordings. They release several open source tools for analyzing high dimensional data and performing modeling and visualization. He's recently won an NSF career award, which will provide funding for his lab research using NLP and ge geometric data analysis to study and enhance classroom learning, a subject I presume he will discuss today. Uh, you can visit context-lab.com context to see all of what Jeremy and his team have been doing. Please join me in welcoming Jeremy as he shares his talk with us titled, uh, Improving Real World Learning Using Scalable Automated Teachers. So take it away, Jeremy, thanks a lot. Thanks so much, and, and thanks so much for inviting me to, to talk with you today. Um, really excited to, to tell you a little bit about uh, what my lab's been up to. Um, also, I don't know the kind of typical format of these, but please feel free to jump in with uh, or interrupt anytime with like questions, comments, even like random thoughts or ideas or potential connections to things you're interested in or, or working on. Um, so, you know, you can. And oftentimes people do put questions in the chat. Um, and you don't so have to like stop your talk. Well, you can also just address them when you're done speaking, but you can choose to uh, engage with them in whatever whatever time you'd like. Okay, yeah. Um, you know, also feel free to just like unmute yourself and start talking, and I'll <laughs> I'm used to that with uh, Zoom teaching, okay. so uh, feel free. Um, yeah, I I you know I as much as I love to hear myself speak, I'd, I'd much rather have like an interesting discussion than just like sit here talking my computer screen. So um, totally happy to go off topic or dig more into anything you're excited about. Um, and I'm also happy to like not get through all my slides. Um, okay. So um, my, my lab does a lot of different kinds of work, um, all uh, as Colin said, I, organized around like understanding the brain network at brain network dynamics that support learning and memory. Um, but today I want to focus on a subset of my work on how we can use computational models and tools to enhance or optimize the way we teach and learn. Um, let's see. So in the science fiction world, technology enhanced learning is is super easy. Uh, does anyone know what movie this is from? the matrix <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> um yeah so in the world of the matrix you just like download information you want to know directly into your brain hard drive style and then you know suddenly you know kung fu or how to fly a helicopter um but in the real world learning is harder and i view this not just as a research problem um, but as a societal challenge that we're going to need to solve as a species. So back in the day, getting a PhD in chemistry meant that you had learned to a sufficiently good approximation all of humanity's collective knowledge about chemistry, and that maybe you'd even expanded on that pool of knowledge with a new discovery. But today, getting a PhD in chemistry often means like learning about a single molecule. And it's not that we're lazier or dumber that to like today than we were back then. Um, if anything, I, you know, global pandemic notwithstanding, we're way more productive than we've ever been before. But humanity's knowledge pool has been growing at an accelerating rate as new discoveries leverage older discoveries. So that means that our ability to acquire a fixed fraction of humanity's total knowledge is getting harder and harder over time. So as an interdisciplinary scientist, that's distressing to me because it means that deep expertise across many domains is going to become increasing, increasingly rare. Um, but it's also becoming increasingly more important that we keep up with humanity's knowledge pool if we as individuals are going to have any hope of understanding the new discoveries even we ourselves make. Um, and over the past few years, we're already starting to see this idea of machine-aided cognition and creation across many domains. Um, so there's Microsoft's off, uh, awesome like GitHub co-pilot project for code generation. Um, and also we have some examples of like language generation more broadly with models like GPT-3 and Lambda. 
And in uh, text to image models like Dolly, Dolly2, Imogen, um, almost every domain has examples of this from like predicting protein folding to playing games to autonomous driving and, and many more. Um, and I think these advances are super, super exciting. Um, but I also think we don't need to stop at letting deep networks think for us. Um, instead, I think what we need is new ways of learning. So to drive that point home, think about what it would mean for you personally if you could learn much faster. So imagine you could just like sit down with some program and learn a totally new language in just a few hours or, or learn like a textbook's worth of information in that time or an entire undergraduate degree's worth of information or even a doctorate's worth of information. Or imagine learning everything you've learned up to this point in your life after you know all these years. Imagine you could have learned that way faster. Like what could you have done with the rest of that time? Um, so I'm not saying I have the time scale exactly right here, um, but I, I think it's worth thinking about how the ability to absorb and understand much, much more quickly than you can now would change your life. Like, what, you know, what could you discover? What could you accomplish? Um, so I think accelerated learning is going to change nearly every aspect of human society and thought. Um, so outside of Neo's science fiction universe, Matrix, quickly cramming knowledge into your brain is kind of a tricky business. Um, but I, I don't think it's insurmountable. Um, so as an exercise, try thinking about some of the most effective teachers or mentors that you've had in your life. Um, so you, you know, maybe you've encountered them during your formal schooling or maybe they're friends and family or fellow students in your classes or tour guides or colleagues at work. Um, you know, sometimes great teachers are people you like or get along with and sometimes they're just super good at getting you to learn stuff. Um, and you don't even have to know or interact with teachers personally. Like movie directors are experts at getting you to digest vast quantities of information quickly. And uh, online educators like Saul uh, Khan and others have figured out how to effectively reach even really broad audiences. Um, what I've come to believe after you know, several decades myself as an educator is that effective teaching is fundamentally about empathy. It, it kind of requires maintaining a mental model of the learner's goals and motivations and interests and current knowledge base. And that gives you, you know, a scaffolding or foundation that you're going to build from. And then you also need a deep and flexible understanding of the learning objectives. And then the teacher's job is essentially to like transform the to be learned material into something that can be warped onto the learner's existing scaffolding. And that means communicating in a way that fits within the learner's current frameworks and then figuring out when the learner is ready to acquire each next kind of nugget of knowledge. And what I want to explore is which aspects of great teaching can be automated and scaled up to any sort of content you might want to learn about and any person who might want to learn it. The, uh, the approach my lab is taking to automating and scaling learning and teaching comes down to uh, six kind of broad subtasks. So first, we need a way of describing the full scope of human knowledge and thought, like every, everything humans might think or want to know about. Um, second, we need a way of describing the dynamics of knowledge and thoughts. In other words, like how do thoughts change over time? Or how does our knowledge change over time? And how does our knowledge relate to what thoughts we've had up until now? Third, um, we need to be able to solve what I call the, the matching problem. So if we refer to the same concept in different ways, you, like using different words, we're not going to be able to use simple text comparisons to identify those matches. We need to model the deeper representations that are reflected by words but that go beyond the specific words themselves. Fourth, not all knowledge is equally accessible to us at a given moment. So at the extreme, you know, I'm not going to be able to teach you to write code before you know how to read. But even within a single lecture in a given course, concepts also often build on each other. And uh, so you can think of concepts as having a sort of dependency structure that we have to be mindful of. Uh, fifth, 
We need ways of testing whether whatever representations or estimates we generate uh, are you know, accurate. So for example, if I think you know something, I should be able to measure that in some way, whether it's by having you answer a question or demonstrate some skill, et cetera. And then finally, we're gonna need to stitch these components together into a viable training system. So I'll you know, say more about that piece in a bit after I've satisfied a few more knowledge dependencies in, in this talk. Um, a really useful tool that my lab uses for thinking about knowledge and thoughts is a geometric space that I like to call a concept space or a, a thought space. Um, so if you're familiar with text embedding models, uh, thought spaces are the geometric spaces that text gets embedded in. So the idea, uh, in case you're not familiar with these models, is that each point in these, spe uh, in these spaces is going to represent some thought or set of thoughts we could have. And points that are nearby in Euclidean distance represent thoughts that are semantically or conceptually related. So for example, uh, like duck and goose live near each other in this space, but duck and truck live far apart. Um, and then if we were to track your thoughts as you're doing some task or learning about some new thing, we could trace out a path that your thoughts took over time. So I'll call this a thought trajectory. Um, so if and when we can estimate them accurately, uh, thought trajectories allow us to test cognitive theories using the tools available to us from the field of geometry. Um, so for example, remembering something that happened earlier means we're uh, revisiting old thoughts. So geometrically, that's gonna look like a loop in your thought trajectory. So in the like topological sense, the loopiness of your thought trajectory tells us something about how much remembering you might be doing during a particular interval. Um, and I, I should also note that even though I'm drawing this uh, kind of thought space here as three dimensional to make it easy to visualize, um, when we actually build these models in the lab, they're typically much higher dimensional, um, but we can still project them onto low dimensional spaces to gain visual insights and intuitions into how they look. So here are some real thought trajectories from people listening to a story. So to estimate these trajectories, um, we used brain imaging data collected as people were listening to this story. And then we used half of the data to learn a mapping between neural space, where the brain data live, and text embedding space, where the dynamic content of the story lives. And here I'm showing the thought trajectories for the second half of the story that are estimated using the mappings learned from the first half. Um, so in this animation, each colored line uh, reflects thoughts from a different person. Um, and you can really start to see in this example how powerful this framework can be. So for example, you know, you can see that there are certain parts of the story where everyone's thoughts seem to deflect. You know, maybe those uh, correspond to changes in like the narrative arc of the story. Or even though people's thoughts tend to change together, we can see that they're not identical across people. So we could ask, you know, at each moment of the story, how spread out are different people's thoughts? Or, um, you know, are the moments when everyone's thoughts are especially similar, particularly engaging parts of the story? Or when people's thoughts diverge, are those particularly, you know, abstract parts of the story? We could also look at individual differences. So for example, when one person's thoughts diverge from the group, could we explain that as some property of the person or the story or some interaction between the person and the story? Um, thought trajectories turn these high level questions about the dynamics of thoughts into specific hypotheses that we can test using geometric tools for comparing and characterizing shapes. So using text embedding models oh, to construction. Oh yeah, yeah, jump in. Was that data captured with fMRI or some kind of like electrode or something? This particular data set was collected with fMRI. So, you know, people lie in the scanner and we play the story over audio. So they're listening to a story. Just a story. Each person, they weren't listening together. They were listening alone, but to the same recording. So you sync yeah, up the listening. recordings with the recording being played. <clears throat> yeah, so um, if you're familiar with the the Moth Radio Hour, it's this uh, 
like I don't know if any, if it's popular on the the West Coast, but on the East Coast it's it's a thing, and uh, it's like kind of well told stories, you, and we just play the recording, and then um, in this particular analysis, I'm part of the pre processing is like syncing up the timing to the you know first moment of the story. And that's so that's like how we find. Looks like the total time scale of this little repeating image. Oh yeah, it's way fast. Yeah, it's it's about a ten minute story. So this is way faster than uh, the in than you know the story actually unfolds. Um, in cool. fMRI, you get a kind of brain measurement every one and a half seconds under the framework we use. Um, so you know the time scale it kind of looks better if you speed it up. But yeah, the, the whole animation is about five, you know, it takes about five minutes. Um, I'm seeing people say stuff in the chat, but I, oh, here we go. Uh, what are your thoughts on how learning of knowledge actually translates into people's behaviors? Um, yeah, so, and like, does the person have to have some sort of painful experience? I don't, I'll talk about that later when I get to uh, kind of talking about how we're automating the teaching process. I don't think learning has to be painful, um, but, uh, and it's, I guess, debatable whether learning has to be effortful. Um, uh, and you use an example of, so it looks like these are comments from Dan, uh, don't touch hot plate. Um, yeah, so like, I guess that's getting at like, what role does experience play in learning? Or can someone just tell you this is hot, it's gonna hurt if you touch it, and then you don't have to touch it yourself? You know, I think that's an empirical question, but I think there, are, you know, in general, there are some things you can learn through, you know, you have to learn through experience. We're not gonna be able to teach those through automated methods and lots of things can be learned through uh, people teaching you without you having to experience themselves. History, for example, you can't experience history yourself, but people can certainly learn about history. Um, Sumit, did you have a? Yeah, so I was wondering if you can use these trajectories to help define the quality of a story or to give feedback to the storyteller, how effective you know, a given uh, variant of a story is. Yeah, that's, that's exactly, yeah, that's one of the things we're thinking about here. So um, effectiveness um, can be defined in a lot of ways, but one way of defining it is like, um, so it's not a perfect measure, but one of the measures we use is like, um, if we're recording brain data from you as you're listening to a story, we can ask how similar does your brain look as you're listening to the story, you know, moment by moment, to the average of everyone else as they were listening to the same moment by moment parts of the story. Um, so if your brain looks really similar to everyone else's, it kind of indicates to us that you're not mind wandering during the story. Um, what it doesn't capture is like if you have some brilliant new insight in response to a story that's not, you know, typical, then that's going to look like mind wandering when actually it's like particularly good engagement. And so there's limits to that approach, but it gets us somewhere. Uh, is it Neil? Uh, did did you have a question too? Yeah, I had a comment. I thought he's starting to say something, and then um, uh, I guess so. One thing, because you were talking about teachers and learning, I thought I was going to see something like, let's say a teacher teaches something, and then the later part is a continuous conversation, continued conversation, and then sure. how much is how much have different people learned, or how differently have they learned if the patterns. Um, so I thought yeah, you were going we'll to start to say that. Oh, you are going to go. Yeah, okay. we have to. Yeah, we'll build up to that. We need a few of the kind of other pieces. So. You know, the the way I um, I view it is, you know, we've got these different kind of problems that we have to solve to build up to there. So, um, you know, using text embedding models to construct thought spaces and thought trajectories helps us to solve the first two problems on these lists uh, on this list. So, each coordinate in text embedding spaces. Um, Oh, I just got a bad network quality notice. Can everyone still, I don't know, I'm still seeing you. Uh, okay. You're coming through, um, I think you can ignore it. Okay, okay, I'll ignore it. Uh, the packets have to travel a long distance to get to New Hampshire. Um, 
So each coordinate in text embedding space describes some concept that you could learn or know or think about. Um, and if we can manage to choose the right training corpus, or even if we just use like a really enormous corpus that covers as many domains of human thought as we can find, then the scope of these embedding spaces starts to approximate everything we could learn or think. Um, so that solves that first problem to some approximation. And then uh, the geometries of these spaces tell us about how different concepts relate. Um, and then we can pick out the thought or set of thoughts we're having at a particular moment or like trace out how thought or conceptual content changes over time. Um, let me see. Uh, yeah, so here, here's another example of how we can gain insights into cognition or thought, uh, into cognition using thought trajectories. Um, so, and this is a little bit more similar to Neil, what you discussed related to like kind of natural conversation. So, um, in this uh, data set, we had people watch a television, an episode of a television show uh, that uh, it's called Sherlock, uh, like about Sherlock Holmes by the BBC. And then after they finished watching the episode, we just had them like verbally recount what happened and they were allowed to take, they were told to take at least 10 minutes. Um, and then we just let them talk as long as they want. Sometimes they took up to an hour just talking um, in the, the one hour show. So, you know, talking for an hour after an hour show is, is a lot of data. Um, so so uh, what I'm showing on the left is the thought trajectory that reflects how the episode itself unfolds over time. And we made that by fitting a text embedding model to a set of detailed descriptions that a group of research assistants made by painstakingly annotating uh, what was happening in each camera shot in the episode. And the like red dots correspond to the beginning of the episode, and then the colors fade to blue as time progresses. Um, there's like some additional processing that happens here to segment these trajectories into discrete events and project everything onto a 2D plane. Um, but the way to think about the trajectory on the left is that it tells us what happened in the television episode. Um, and then the trajectory on the right shows how people talked about what happened in the episode when they remembered it later. So there's no brain data here. This is made just using a dynamic text embedding model that, uh, that gets fit to the transcripts of people's verbal recalls. Um, and again, there's some pre-processing happening here to segment the trajectories into discrete events and then project them into the same thought space as the trajectory on the left. Um, so so but, a quick question. So what are the color yeah, recordings here? It's just time. Oh, it's time. So, so, so red means early and then blue means late. And then what's a, what's a space here or the shape? So the um, events that are nearby in space are about similar content as oh, captured so, by oh, this. Okay, so this is just model. plus. A cluster, separate teased out cluster. Okay. So well, it's it's uh, there's no clustering specifically applied here, but it's um, yeah, so it's like points that are nearby in the text embedding space will get mapped onto similar point. We're just projecting it onto two two dimensions, um, okay. but you know. Um, and right. what's uh, what's I, I guess you could say it's what do you learn from by, this? So what yeah, do you so, so one, yeah, uh, that's a good question. So so one thing that stood out to me when we first created these plots is that the shapes on the left and right look really similar. So that immediately tells us that people are remembering the episode pretty well. Um, and we can also look at agreement across people. So the bluish arrows on the right show the average directions that different people's recall trajectories progressed given that they pass through that part of thought space. And then the like bluer and longer arrows denote when we saw reliable agreement across people. So you can see that the arrows form a sort of like current that follows the shape of the recall trajectory. And that means that people tended to describe what happened in the episode in similar ways. So on one hand, you know, it's not super surprising that different people who watch the same television episode could remember what happened well or that they described what happened in the episode similarly to each other. But if you think about what our approach needs to be capturing in order to find this pattern, it's kind of neat. 
So different people used totally different words and spoke for different amounts of time when they verbalized their memories. And also the ways they actually experienced the episode um, through their senses as a sequence of sights and sound, you know, people's brains needed to translate those experiences, that raw data into spoken language, and that happened independently for each person. But this geometric approach to looking at what they said allows us to focus in on the underlying conceptual content, and it allows us to compare and contrast different people's memories of this shared experience, and then also compare those rememberings to the original experience. Maybe, maybe I'm trying to read too much into it. I was trying to see yeah. if, um, so it's not like, okay, there's something that was there in the early in the story that I need to recall later, something like an LSTM, or there's nothing of that kind I should read. That correct? Well, there are parts of the story that refer to earlier parts. So I don't have a slide on this, but I actually wrote a paper uh, about a year ago on this. Um, this story is, it's like a murder mystery. And um, early in the story, you kind of learn clues. And then later on, you have to refer to those clues in your mind to kind of understand what's going on. And so there's some looping back of the narrative. Uh, you can see like the narrative intersects itself. So, you know, this means that, you know, the second event here in the story is referred to later when we get to the kind of the yellowish part of the story. Okay, but not too far. It doesn't go to the blue part. Um... Well, this is just a property of the narrative, right? So yeah, 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 yeah. you could have another narrative that loops back a lot of times, but in this particular story, and you know, we have other, we've done this in, with other sorts of narratives that are like really, really loopy or that are like basically linear. So they don't ever loop back on themselves. Um, and that has interesting consequences in terms of like how you process and remember you know, those narratives. Um, Who are the nodes, then scenes? They're, the they're, so they're events. So um, kind of the time points in this analysis, well, at least on the, the, the video side, are uh, scene cuts. So every time the camera shot changes, um, we get some text, and then we're embedding that text. And then that gives us like a time series of, you know, text features. And then we're using hidden Markov models to segment that time series into discrete events. So each uh, big dot here, each dot here is like a, like the average text embedding for all the events in some kind of hidden Markov model identified state. And then there's an additional piece to this model, which is that we define the transit, we constrain the transition matrix that we learned so that it never repeats itself exactly. So it has to exhibit a sequence of states. The states can never repeat in this particular implementation, which is kind of different from the classic implementation. Um, okay. And then you applied the same model to people's recalled events. Did you just yeah. tell the model that it would have, right. should have the same number of scene cuts? And then so that's why there's a similar number of of nodes? No, actually, so that just comes out of it. So yeah, with um, people talking, it's just continuous speech. So it's not segmented naturally in any way. Uh, it's just like a stream of words. It's not even segmented in. We use like a sliding window approach. So we take, you know, some number of words. Um, I think it's around 50 words or something like that. And then we just embed you know 50 words at a time and then slide the window by one word and so we get a again like a time series of embeddings and then we again apply these hidden markov models to detect the individual events um but they're not constrained to have the same number of events it happens that they do but that's that just falls out of the analysis it's not it's not necessary that it happens or i guess maybe it's not exactly the same they just if there's an overlap it's, it, yeah nodes I, yeah i think the uh I think the recalls have like two fewer events than the original, if I if I remember. It comes out slightly different, you know, depending on what random seed we use and stuff like that. But how many people yeah. are in the study? Like in this study? This particular study, so it, it's actually it is a brain imaging study. Um, so the sample size is pretty low. 
I'm not going to talk about the brain data, but I think there were 17 people in this study. Um, but you can even get this on a single participant level. So I, I didn't paste in the slide on that. It's in our paper, though. Um, but you know, you can get these trajectories just for one person for you know one transcript, and they look pretty good. So, so let's say they're all very similar. I uh, question. So can can this be used to create new kinds of word embeddings? Because let's say it's a representation of how humans remember things and stitch things together, et cetera. Because today, the way we create word embeddings is just by physical proximity of words. So, but now this gives us a neural proximity. And can we create word embeddings based upon neural pro proximity? I don't know if you've experimented with that. Um, in some sense, this is probably the closest yeah, to we're, how human yeah, brain works. So we're starting to play around with that sort of thing. Yeah. So. Um, there are lots of ways to measure neural proximity and at different time scales. So fMRI data, this particular experiment was an fMRI experiment. So again, you get like measurements uh, once every, in this experiment, it was like about every one second, we used a faster sampling right here. Um, but uh, so there, are, you know, the natural kind of rate of talking is you often use several words per second. So we don't have like word level resolution in this way of measuring brain data. Um, but you know, you can use a sliding window approach to say like, what was the average brain activity during like these 50 words you said, and what was the average embedding coordinate? And you can do exactly what you said. So you can say, I want my text embeddings to reflect the similarity structure that we're measuring from the brain. Um, it's, it's not perfect because people, when they're watching a movie, don't only think about the movie. Um, and so we have some neural processing tricks that we use to try to clean up the brain signal and try to like dig out the stuff that's driven by the stimulus versus kind of non-stimulus driven thoughts or activity patterns. Um, and, but and the, and the nice thing with that is that also you can tell the same story different ways and actually tease out um, tease out the things that uh, actually makes sense. Yeah, well, right? well, well, that's what's happening here too, right? So some people talked for 10 minutes they're going to get into a different level of detail than people who talked for 50 minutes about a 50 minute episode. Um, but when you line up their trajectories, the shapes look similar. So that's kind of cool. Um, and then, um, yeah. And then like other, just to kind of, since you mentioned it, so in addition to like neural embedding, so you can use like activity patterns, you can use network patterns, which is another kind of piece of my labs uh, work. Um, but you can also use perceptual judgments. So you could say like, which events did you think went together in this story from like a narrative perspective and use that to drive the embeddings, et cetera. Yeah. Uh, but, but yeah, um, and you know, in courses you can say which concept or which concepts in a course depend on each other, which concepts are like similar in some way. Um, and that can be done within or across courses. So it's a powerful tool. Okay. Um, another trick we can use is that because we know the conceptual content of every point in thought space, like we can, you know, for example, create a word cloud for every point in a text embedding space, we can look at really subtle differences between what happened in an experience versus how someone described that experience later. So here the left, um, not sure what the resolution you're getting on your end is. So you might not be able to actually read the text, but um, if you can, the left halves of these circles show the inferred word clouds of, of six events from the episode. And then the right halves show inferred word clouds for how people spoke about these events when they described them later from memory. Um, and then like the events in green match well and the events in red match you know, relatively poorly. Um, mm. So reading these, trajectories and word clouds takes some getting used to. You kind of have to like let your mind relax and let them kind of wash over you. Um, but you know, whether you're visualizing how people's memories were distorted from the original movie on average, or whether you're trying to compare memories across people, we can use these sorts of analyses to start to understand like exactly which aspects of the original experience of watching the movie were preserved or distorted or just lost altogether. Um, so, and one again, interesting neural discovery TF we idea. Oh, <laughs> well, so this analysis is just using uh, verbal, like verbal recalls. But yeah, you could use a similar, yeah, exactly. You could use uh, a similar thing to say, like, you know, 
how is your experience distorted in your brain relative to the original experience? So we, we actually do that analysis in our paper. I, I'm not showing it here, but that's kind of interesting. Um, the, uh, so one interesting discovery we made using this approach is that like basically nearly everyone who watched the episode, and in fact, all of our participants had a memory trajectory that looked visually similar to the original movie in terms of like its coarse scale, kind of low spatial frequency shape. Um, and that kind of coarse scale shape of these trajectories reflects major narrative elements of the episode story. But when you zoom in on the finer scale or like higher spatial frequency details, people's memories started to differ. And these those like smaller scale changes reflect the more subtle details in the story, like what color was someone's shirt or like, you know, other stuff like that. Um, so it tells us that when people share the common experience of watching this movie, the major narrative elements are prioritized by people's memory systems, but the lower level details are deprioritized. So it like, you know, tells us something about how memory works. Um, so this study demonstrates how we can use text embeddings to start to solve the matching problem. So we had the original uh, episode's content, which people experienced as a combination of images and sounds. So, you know, not text. And then people's brains had to translate those raw inputs into spoken language when they recounted the episode later. But our text embeddings were able to match up each person's recounting of the different major plot points with the corresponding events in the original episode, and also with other people's retellings of the same events, even though the wordings and even the level of detail differed across people. Um, so now that we've built up some like key tools and intuitions, we can start combining them to understand like more targeted learning and instru like instruction of specific concepts. Um, so in one of our recent experiments, we had a bunch of our you know participants um, watch a sequence of two course videos from the Khan Academy platform. Um, and the the first video was about the four fundamental forces in physics, and then the second video was about how stars form. So both of the videos are about like physics related concepts. So their conceptual content somewhat overlaps, but the videos don't depend on each other or reference concepts across the videos. So in that sense, the videos are also like somewhat uh, kind of, uh, they kind of stand alone to an extent. Um, and then before and after watching each video, we also gave our participants short multiple choice quizzes on the material from each video. and. Uh, and, and then the questions also like tested their general physics knowledge. And, the, and these are all like kind of non-physics trained people. Um, so, and, and the quizzes were also generated on the fly uh, independently for each participant by randomly drawing without replacement from three kind of manually created pools of questions. One on video one, one on concepts from video two, and then one about general physics knowledge. Um, so the idea is we're going to use the first quiz, which was taken before the participants have seen any training videos, to establish like a baseline estimate of their knowledge going into the experiment. And then we're going to use the second and third quizzes to try to map out how their knowledge changes after watching each video in turn. Um, so in addition to Khan Academy just like being an incredible resource in its own right, there's a really neat hidden feature of Khan Academy. Um, and it's that for every video on their platform, people have carefully mapped out the complete dependency graph across all videos. So in other words, for any reference video, we can look up you know, through this tool, the full set of other videos that cover the prerequisite knowledge needed to learn and understand content in that reference video. So if you remember back to the beginning of my talk, I mentioned that uh, learning has this dependency structure that limits what you're able to learn given what you know so far. And I use the example of like not being able to teach you to code before you know how to read. Um, solving the dependency problem automatically is highly non-trivial. And uh, like basically other than using human generated judgments like these, I'm not even sure yet how to approach solving it. Um, but using course videos from the Khan Academy uh, platform allows us to kind of get around the dependency problem by using these uh, human generated annotations that already exist. So it lets us 
scale up at least to like tens of thousands of videos on the Khan Academy platform. Um, another okay. challenge. Can you go back a slide? Yeah. It's, oh, back one more slide. Oh, yes. So uh, I remember in my math education, I took linear algebra probably like three or four different times. Um, huh. And I remember as I went higher in level, everything gets rearranged. And early in the, you know, when you're doing linear algebra, you start out with like a linear equation and you start out like doing algebra to solve it. And then you might like do, you know, row representation. It looks kind of like this, but when you get to a higher level, actually everything starts with uh, matrices as transformations, which is kind of like a dead end in this graph. Whereas in like the higher level education, that's the first thing. And then everything falls out of that. So I think so one it's thing, kind of interesting. Yes, that's a, yeah, that's, a, that's actually a really good point. So these, um, the way the dependency graph is kind of tagged in, in this data structure is uh, these are titles of videos. So, you know, when it says, you know, linear systems of equations, it doesn't mean like that's everything about linear systems of equations. It means what's covered by this particular video, which has that matching title. So um, you're right. And, and like, in fact, some of the titles are pretty overlapping across courses and um, you can even have videos reused across courses. So like matrix row operations feeds into like inverting matrices and also representing linear systems with matrix equations. Um, but uh, yeah, so. And typically with con videos, I guess it's a concept per video and not more, so. Well, it depends how you define a concept. So if you, at a course scale, yeah, you could say each video is about basically the concept described by its title, right? Right. Um, but then if you dig in on a finer scale, learning about like, you know, inverting matrices is going to require a bunch of, you know, you could call them sub concepts or they could be concepts in their own right. Um, and, you know, it depends how you define it. I'm not sure there's a universal kind of ground truth definition of what a concept is, but um, yeah. I guess that's kind of the um, question is how universal do you think this dependency tree is? And do you think it's di a directed graph like this? Um, you know, was... I think, yeah, I don't think it's universal, and I don't think this is like, um, I don't think this is exact or capturing. I mean, I've looked through this graph in some detail. I don't fully agree, even agree with all of the kind of tags. It's some, per, it's a human making these judgments. So humans, well, every everything is imperfect, but, you know, some, it's probably like some intern who like, you know, for their summer internship, like tagged tens of thousands of videos and like, you know, do the, can they keep in mind all of the content of all of these tens of thousands of videos? Probably not. Um, so, you know, in practice, I'm guessing they're like going through one course at a time, probably watching the videos on like, you know, 2x speed, not necessarily even understanding all the content and kind of, you know, making their best guesses, maybe it's tag, you know, maybe, I don't know how this data structure generated. We, I just downloaded it, uh, but it's not, it, I don't know how it was validated either, but, you know, just looking through myself, my intuition is that, my sense is that it's not like a 100% accurate and, you know, as courses are added, they've stopped updating this uh, graph. So, you know, it's not gonna capture new stuff either. It just, those are kind of islands, um, the new videos, so. But, it, you know, it gives us a place to start where basically I don't know how to solve this problem automatically. And so it gives us something, right? Presumably you could train a model to make a guess, right? But uh, yeah, uh, Sumi? Yeah, Jeremy. So what I'm thinking here is that even if you are teaching these concepts, you know, in some uh, specific order, there is a different dimension of uh, how it is being taught. So for instance, you know, you watch a video. So that's one way. The other way is also probably you also go through, you know, some practice problems. And uh, uh, what Khan Academy or Khan has done is, is to, um, you know, provide these MCQs, multiple choice, you know, questions. And then a few months ago, uh, you know, there was a teacher uh, somewhere, you know, who was trying to reach out to me to say that, that uh, this is actually uh, becoming a problem 
in the elementary education where teachers do not have time to uh, have the students express themselves uh, and do word problems and then give feedback to students you know on those word problems so i was wondering if you have uh, have any thoughts on the style of teaching you know where for example you know on one extreme we have just watched videos very passive and on the other hand you know it is it is quite active where we give a very free form you know way of you know expressing uh, yourself yeah that's a great question um in the you know approaches my lab is developing we're not varying the style of teaching so all of our kind of teaching programs are basically either you know well in this experiment um that i'm talking about now it's like a pre-existing course so there's no real tweaking to it it's just measuring how people learn from it um in other um i don't know if i'll end up getting to it but another approach we're using is like we can use this like so we use like hidden markov models to segment courses into kind of sub concepts and then you can kind of create remixed versions of these courses so you don't have to watch the full course you can just watch like the snippet of a course that covers some specific concept and then stitch together a new like course made up of these snippets and then you can ask like could someone learn faster from that uh, but it's all coming from video so it, you're all getting video learning um we've started to um I guess the closest we've come to like doing like hands-on learning is in how relates to how we ask questions or how we test knowledge. So in this experiment, we ask multiple choice questions and we try to like design the questions to, you know, ask about conceptual content as opposed to like just, you know, content that just requires the kind of rote memorization. But we vary in our success of that. Um, but if we teach things like, uh, so we have another experiment where we're doing like uh, teaching people JavaScript programming, and we have people solve like mini problems, and you know everyone can, like you can call your variables different things, you can organize your code differently, um, but as long as the task like passes our checks, we consider you to have solved the question correctly, um, and that requires kind of, in my view, a deeper understanding of the material than just like selecting which multiple choice question best matches. So that's kind of a, I don't know, I would call that sort of a hands-on approach. I don't know that, like, we're not kind of using the, we're using the uh, people's responses as input to what they, like, uh, to estimate what they know rather than, like, as part of the learning process. But presume, like, you know, you could imagine practice helps you learn. I mean, I think it does. Problem sets are always super useful in classes. I use them in my classes, and uh, I think it's critical. Um, so. Okay. Yeah. So Jeremy, now that you brought up the mention of programming, and I also you know see that we are close, nearing the end of the you know time here. So I would like to actually you know discuss this topic with you. Uh, so how can you know some of these methods um, help us understand um, how to innovate in programming education, and also in particular as we are uh, working on building these AI bots that can help students you know learn programming. Uh, so what should we, you know, what aspects you know, should we focus on or what is the simplest thing, you know, these bots can do uh, that will have the maximum impact? Um, yeah. So how can I actually follow so, up more on this? I, do, I think you'll be able to give some answers, some insights here, but I would love to you know also follow up and read more on this. So any pointers you might also have would be appreciated. Well, so first of all, if you, uh, um, the, uh, if you, if you, are interested in this stuff and you want to learn about my lab's approach if you go to my lab website i have a like talk on kind of specifically our approach to the like automated tutor piece um it's i uh, from about a year ago so we've like updated things since then but you know you're welcome to check that out or you know if you want to reach out by email i'm happy to like sort of answer your question. So like in I'll I'll just kind of go through th so a few kind of ideas I think are important since we just have a, another minute or two. Um one thing that I think is really important for like using like kind of automating the education process is getting high resolution estimates of like exactly what people know and and like exactly what each moment of teaching is trying to teach. And essentially, we can use these text embedding models 
So you get like an embedding for the question and then an embedding for each moment of a course. And we can ask how much is each course question asking about each moment of the course, right? And we get out these time series and we can now start to tease up, like get kind of a more nuanced picture than just like, oh, you answered this proportion of questions correctly. We can say, which parts of the course did you answer questions correctly about? And like, which questions are getting at similar sorts of concepts, right? Um, and that gives us like these time series of like what your understanding was at each moment. And then we can even map out. So, you know, you can ask how much is each question asking about each moment of a lecture, but you could also ask about any arbitrary content. Like how much is each question, a question about like, you know, I, uh, you know, hydrogen, how much is that asking about some totally different topic like art history? It's just correlating word embeddings. And so we can get these full maps. So from any arbitrary set of questions, we can completely map out all of your knowledge to some extent. And then we can see like, how does your knowledge change over time as you experience different course lectures? So that gives us like a super detailed view of what you experience. And then I'll we do some testing of that, those predictions. So like, can we predict held out questions? And then I can kind of skip to the like full kind of tutor outline diagram. But basically you keep, you know, you can define what you want to learn as some set of coordinates in text embedding space. And then your knowledge is some map of how well you know each concept in text embedding space. And then we can chop up videos into tiny pieces and say, how much is each tiny snippet of a video asking, like kind of teaching you about each kind of potential concept you could learn about. And then you have to, we like use the pre-existing dependency labels to remove kind of, to like come up with a set of candidate clips that whose dependencies you've satisfied. So there's like a pruning step, but then you kind of show someone the next snippet of video that uh, is gonna kind of most further their learning in the direction of the their learning goal. Um, and you can kind of think about it as like, if the content of some video you know, covers some trajectory and some other video covers some other trajectory in text embedding space that either intersects or like goes nearby to that first video, um, what this approach lets you do is start to come up with like, you can create shortcuts. So if you don't need to go through the full trajectory of some video's content, you can kind of splice in another video and take a shortcut. Or if someone needs more background on a particular part of you know, this space, you can splice in kind of a snippet of another video that wasn't part of the original course and kind of give some more background that's needed at the right time. So you're kind of trying to give, given your best estimate of what someone knows at this moment and what they're able to digest at this moment, like, you know, what piece, like what tiny piece of each course are they gonna most benefit from? Um, and, we're trying to bring this into classrooms with, we've got like a brain recording way of uh, estimating this, uh, which is kind of fun. Um, it kind of bypasses our need to ask people questions. So we can just have their record their brain and say, um, and use that to estimate how much you're learning at each moment. And then there's no user input. It's just people watching videos and we use their brain activity to kind of drive these uh, um, kind of automated tutors. Um, and uh, yeah, so um, I guess the last point I, I want to make is um, like, I, let's see. Um, so I, I see this kind of line of work on optimizing learning as part of a much broader question space about how we can send and receive information to each other when we communicate. Um, so we can use thought space models to quantify the conceptual content of our conversations too, not just between students and teachers, but between you know any type of conversation, doctors and patients, people just chatting. Um, and the alignment between how much my thought space is aligned with your thought space around the locations in thought space we're communicating about could tell us about how effectively we could communicate about those concepts. And by mapping problems about conversation onto these geometric thought spaces, we can start to use the sort of mathematical machinery we know and love to optimize communication. 
Um, and we can also start to explore like bandwidth limitations of human communication or to explore how we might surpass our natural limits of you know using technologies like AR or VR to augment our abilities. Um, so I, I think augmented cognition, kind of the next great frontier of human knowledge expansion. And like, I'm super excited to keep pushing the limits about, uh, you know, of how people communicate and, and think. Um, so I see we're out of time. So I'll just thank you for your attention. And uh, I'd also like to thank the members of my lab and uh, our various funding agencies that supported the work I told you about today. Um, thanks again for the opportunity to speak with you. Um, I'm happy to answer questions if there's still time. Um, uh, but yeah, thanks so much. Oh, I see a question from the chat. Yeah, sure thing. You know, we, we want to be respectful of your time. So if you need to leave, you should feel free. But uh, I think anyone here also can leave or stay if you have questions. Um, yeah, I'm happy to can jump right for in. a few more minutes. Um, do I think Neuralink like devices can directly embed or write these concept embeddings into the brain? I mean, yeah, that's the matrix view of uh, how learning might work, right? So you treat the brain as a hard drive and you just write to it. Um, a pretty big challenge to um, using the brain as a hard drive is that um, although there are some similarities in how people represent concepts, in other words, like how your neural patterns map onto kind of thoughts that you describe, um, they're not exactly the same. So the fine spatial resolution brain details differ across people. Device, um, we're using, like I have another branch of my lab that um, works with, we use like brain stimulation. And so this DARPA project here, uh, DARPA was interested in like, you know, essentially doing what you're asking here with soldiers, like, uh, can we like bypass parts of their brain to improve soldiers' memories and stuff like that? Um, it, it we're limited, it, like we're somewhat limited by like how finely we can, how well we can record brains and how finely we can stimulate. And basically, the resolution that we can do this so far, even with our most advanced devices, is just not sufficiently good yet to kind of write in detail. Um, but you know, could imagine it how it might happen someday. I think um, the most promising approach is actually in rodent work using it's called optogenetics, but basically you like put a virus into uh, you like you infect you, you you create a virus that in, will infect a certain type of neuron, and the virus kind of splices in a special type of DNA that's light sensitive, and you can do this with different viruses getting uh, kind of. DNA that's sensitive to different wavelengths of light. And then you can use a tunable laser to stimulate specific networks of neurons by like, you know, kind of tuning the laser. Um, that's That gives us kind of the highest resolution possible, but it's only in rats and it's probably unethical to like, you know, genetically modify living humans' brains, but maybe someday. <laughs> if, you can, if you can reverse it, I guess you can, right? Um, um... In some sense, we it, it is done through other means like watching television or uh, or, or um, listening to shock radio, right? Um, well, so you can think of communication, like spoken communication, as wireless transmission, right? So you take some experience in your brain, you compress it into a into language, which is a huge compression problem, right? So your raw experiencers are extremely rich. Um, you've got like you know, high definition audio and video recording all the time, right? Um, and now you have to transmit it through a super low bandwidth pipeline to another brain. Mm -hmm. And what someone else has to do is take that, like the words, which are kind of a low information content pipeline and decompress it in their brain. And that requires kind of building a mental model of like, okay, well, what would you have, like, you know, what, what would you, Neil, have done what might explain why you used particular words to send them to my brain? And I have to build a mental model of your brain and how you experience the world. My ability to do that is going to depend on my ability to like share your experiences and thoughts. Um, some people might not be able to communicate effectively because they can't solve this compression and decompression problem well. Right. Um, but that's one that is one way to get 
thoughts from your brain into my brain um, is just by speaking. And movies and you know written text do this too, right? Exactly. Yeah. Hey, thank you so um, much. Wonderful talk. Yeah. Uh, yeah, thanks a lot. Sure thing. Yeah. All right. Uh, thanks so much. Yeah. Was, yeah great yeah, questions. Read more of your stuff. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Uh, if you, you know, I also like, I'm a open science nerd. So like, you know, all of our code and data sets and whatnot are are on my website too, if you if you want to check those so, out. So one question I have is, so when you do this, um, the, this brain, exp how expensive are these experiments? I Meaning how laborious are they? <laughs> um, um, so fMRI, is about a thousand bucks an hour. Um, so for liquid helium superconducting magnets. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Heal it basically does come down to helium is super expensive. Uh, you also need to pay like an MR physicist, so they're kind of on call full time. So that's expensive. And then we have to have a like medical doctor also on call full time in case you know if we discover a tumor or like someone's having an aneurysm, then we're like ethically obligated to kind of act on that. So is, it, so is it is it done in kind of a special environment given all this? And I wonder because it's done in a special environment, does it have this environmental effect that plays into your readings? Right? Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, yes, it's it's a super. It's also it's like if you've ever had an MRI, it's it's the same machine, right? So it's like super noisy. It's uncomfortable. You're cramped. People get claustrophobic. Um, it's very non natural. Um, so. That's kind of a problem. Um, the other main domain that my lab records from is in hospitals with these like implanted electrodes. So I mentioned like the Starpa project. Yeah, so there we're like working with neurosurgeons to like drill into people's brains and stick wires in. That's also, it's like you go into the hospital, it's like someone's having a heart attack next door, someone's having a seizure. Nurses are like constantly running in and out, Pe families visiting and interrupting, kids are running around and screaming. And well, like we're trying to get people to like, yeah, yeah, those are super cool experiences. But if we're trying to get at like the neural representations of like you watching a specific movie that are like shared across people, it's it's hard, right? But you know, we do our best. Um, and uh, kind of the best technique we have for um, measuring brain activity in the real world is like EEG. So we have these three D printed cheap EEG headsets that we can like send out to people in the real world. We can like have them drive, we can have them walk around, they're battery powered. We can have them like wear a laptop in their bag and uh, it's fully portable and it's like noisy if you move, but you know, we can use signal processing to somewhat, but not fully, but somewhat uh, mitigate that. And then you get like real world uh, recording. So that's kind of the best we can do in the real world. Very cool. Cool. Well, uh, yeah, thank, yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your Follow great your questions. Board. And yeah. yeah, cool. All right. Take care, everyone. Take care. Thanks for joining us, Jeremy. Thanks, everyone. Have a great rest. Thank you. Thanks, Jeremy. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye.